Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and this is your word at the middle of the week. This is the middle of the first week of Lent, which means it is a Lenten Wednesday, and I don't know what that means for everyone joining us here today or listening to this video, uh, but at least here in central Wisconsin, it often means worship services, soup suppers, a gathering of the faithful at the middle of the week in order to deepen our devotion, our knowledge, our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us on the cross. Now we take a little break from Word in the Middle of the Week in the month of February, but we'll be talking or, or doing it again here uh, in Lent and in March, today being March 1st. And what we're going to talk about is beauty. Do you care about beauty? There's a couple of reasons why we're talking about beauty. Yeah, on April 14th, 15th, and 16th, Zion will be hosting a festival of Christian arts and culture. And our whole hope with that is to bring in people here to Wausau and Marathon County and whoever joins us, joins us. Sometimes people drive in from beyond Marathon County for events that we hold, and that'll be great if they do. But our hope is to bring people in uh, who show us the connection between faith and art and culture. Uh, visual art, poetry, music, how we live, uh, how we structure our society around us, how we build a safe place for the human race to flourish. And not just the human race, but for all of creation to flourish. That's really, if I were to describe what culture is, culture is building a place, turning a space into a place where God's creation may flourish. And different peoples develop different kinds of cultures for that end for creating a place where people flourish. So how has the Christian faith contributed to the flourishing and the beauty of life in this world? It's an important question because it goes to the question of goodness. Why is the Christian faith good? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, we hear in the book of Psalms. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, not just seeing, but also tasting, that the Lord is good. And uh, there's a goodness to Christian faith that is much larger than some sort of divine insurance policy that when we die, we go to heaven, which is how a lot of people look at the faith, of course. And, and certainly that is part of it, that there is life after this life and a new life that has emerged in Jesus Christ and that is now beginning to flourish in the world. But it's not just about life after life, life after death. It's about life now as well. And faith in Christ makes life good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So the whole point of the Festival of Christian Arts and Culture that we'll be hosting here at Zion, again, that third weekend in April, 14th, 15th, and 16th, is to help us see that connection and also to pay attention to something that Christians sometimes don't pay attention to, and that is the arts. The arts, entertainment, storytelling, some of those things get lost in the midst of other things that Christians can pay more attention to. We pay attention to worship, we pay attention to service, caring for others, thinking of different ways to help people, and we sometimes forget that building a beautiful culture where people can flourish, generally speaking, is part of that. So we're going to be talking about that, uh, part of the, the goodness of the Lord. And I was struck that this may be a good study for us when I was talking about our festival of Christian arts and culture with a colleague in ministry, not someone that I serve with here at Zion, or Bethany, but someone who serves in another state. And he said to me, well, why are you doing that? He said, I, I really don't think your people will be very interested in beauty. 
And that surprised me. That comment surprised me. I was thankful he made that comment. And I'll explain why I was thankful in a minute. But that statement surprised me. And I wondered, is that true? Uh, do you folks not care about beauty? Is it something, is it just decoration, an afterthought, um, something not as important as other things, which I think is what was behind some of his comment. It's, it's not as important as other things. It's decoration. Who cares about that? That's not what the church is about. It surprised me because all my life, it's just been of an, an interest to me. I mean, I can't remember a time where I didn't care about beauty and about how beauty contributes, and of course I didn't think about this as a five-year-old, right? But how beauty contributes to human flourishing. I didn't think about it in those terms, but I cared about it, always have. And I was glad he made that statement because it caused me to pause and articulate why I think it is important and how I think it is a question that people do ask. Why do I care about beauty? Do I care about beauty? Why do I care about beauty? Where will I find beauty? I think that is a question we are asking all the time. I think it is a subject that is of interest to us throughout our lives and that we probably consider every day. Um, so think, for example, of travel. Recently, it seems like I've known a lot of people who have gone to Hawaii. I kind of wonder if Hawaii is doing promotionals here to get people to start going again right after COVID because there's been so many people I've known who have gone to Hawaii. And what do people say when they go to Hawaii or when they plan to go to Hawaii? They say, it's so beautiful, right? And so much of our travel is about going and seeing beautiful things. Why do we have national parks? Why do we have state parks? Why do people go on trips into the mountains of Hawaii or go to the beach of Hawaii? Why is that restorative to us? Why does that refresh our souls? Well, we, when, what we say is it's beautiful. We often use that word to describe things like that. Uh, people, sometimes in the church, we get uh, frustrated with people who will say something like, well, I don't go to church. I find God out in nature. And uh, there's good reasons why we want people who do that to come in from nature to the true nature um, of the church and of its, its daily worship. But what's behind that statement, partly, is that when that person says that, and this is, you know, there's a good in everything, and we need to listen to this. When someone makes that statement, what that person is saying, in part, is I find beauty. I find God in nature. I find beauty in nature. Nature has a beauty that speaks God to me. And maybe it's even a beauty that they sense sometimes is lacking from the church, which maybe we need to pause and think about. Or think about young people and how important beauty is to young people. Think about our culture of beauty products and of fashion, and just the, the way that all of, of popular culture, from music and entertainment to even politics uh, in some way, is absolutely driven um, by driven by a concern for beauty and a desire to have beauty. Uh, here we have a comment. Beauty only exists because there is a God of beauty. If there were no God, there would be no beauty. The whole concept of beauty is a God thing. Beauty is evidence of God. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on beauty from John Hochberger. My pleasure. It's an important subject. And so well stated that um, beauty is anchored and comes from, not just anchored in God, comes from God. That we would not even have a conception of beauty where there's no God. It's same thing with goodness, same thing with truth. Why do we know of truth? Of uh, True and the distinction between true and false, the distinction between good and bad, right, wrong, beauty, beautiful, ugly. These are distinctions that come to us because we live in a creation that has been designed in a certain way by God, who is truth, beauty, goodness, and all of creation uh, designed ultimately to lead us to Him 
and to share, not just lead us to him, but to share him with us. So, yeah, uh, young people are concerned about beauty. Our whole popular culture is driven by image and, and concerns of beauty. Sometimes people will reject that. But what they do when they reject that is they're often embracing simply an alternative vision of what beauty is. And aging. Uh, when people struggle with aging, we've talked about young people. Let's think about when we get older. When people struggle with aging, we certainly struggle with what we're able to do. We're, we struggle with how we feel. But one part of struggling with aging, where there is a struggle, uh, is a struggle struggling with a, a, a perceived loss of beauty. Now, I said a perceived loss of beauty, and this is going to be important as we talk about beauty. Um, the world and the church have different conceptions of beauty, utterly different. And to put it very simply, the, world, the world's view of beauty is uh, ultimately, you might say, a person or a creation where everything is perfect. Some people who study beauty will tell you, we think things are more beautiful the more symmetrical they are, right? You've maybe even seen studies on that. The most beautiful people in the world are the people with the most symmetrical faces. <laughs> I, I mean, I've seen that, that, that was going around, that was, that was on the news shows about, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. That was on the news shows, there were articles written about it. The most beautiful people in the world are people where it's all symmetrical. That's not the Christian view of beauty. As someone once said in a talk that I attended, uh, he showed pictures of uh, people whose faces were deformed. He said, aren't these people beautiful? Isn't there beauty here? The Christian church says yes. Because ultimately, our at the center of our vision of beauty is a crucified man. A man who was pierced for our transgressions. A man who became ugly upon the cross. And the world's greatest beauty, we confess, was conveyed to the world and brought to the world through that crucifixion of this Jesus. A stunning confession. So I want to share three passages with you about that. And the first passage comes from Isaiah chapter 6. This is the vision for which I'm living to see, and I, I hope you are as well. It is the vision that Isaiah had in the year that King Uzziah died. And uh, so this is about 2,500 years ago, a little bit more than that. And starting at verse 1 of chapter 6 in Isaiah, we read the following. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking, and he's speaking about a vision he sees in the temple in Jerusalem. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Seraphim are a kind of angel. Their word seraphim or seraph simply means a bright shining one. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, 
Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So we begin that passage with a vision of great beauty. The Lord enthroned on high, bright shining ones with six wings flying around him. Them, though those bright shining ones so overcome by the vision of God that they have to cover their face as they fly. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. His train of light filling the temple. Martin Luther wrote a beautiful sort of uh, metric version, a hymn of this passage to be sung during the Holy Communion. It's, it's glorious. Isaiah, mighty seer in days of old, the Lord of hosts in glory on high behold, or something like that. It's really lovely. Anyway, uh, it's a beautiful vision. But what is the result of that vision and where does it go? What well, goes first to Isaiah recognizing that he's not worthy of it. As the bright shining ones veil their faces, so does Isaiah go, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And so it begins with a beautiful vision and then the recognition that Isaiah does not share in that beauty, that he does not possess that beauty in himself. But where does it go from that, there? A, one of the seraphim flies down, takes a burning coal from the, the altar, uh, like could have been the altar of incense there, possibly the altar of, of sacrifice. And he touches it to the lips of Isaiah and says, you've now been made clean and your sin is atoned for. The beauty of God doesn't keep to itself. The beauty of God reaches out and makes those who are unbeautiful, ugly, beautiful. This is, this is how God always works. He makes the unlovable lovable. He loves the unlovable. He shares his beauty with those who are not beautiful. He shares his goodness with those who are bad. He shares his grace with those who are sinful. Uh, this is redemption. God sharing his own self and what he possesses with those who lack it. And it even goes on to then say more about the whole people of Israel. And this is frightening language if we really listen to it. Because this is God saying, go ahead and preach the word, but preach it so that they don't hear and they don't repent. Because my wrath is full, filled up, I'm going to pour out that wrath on them and bring to naught, bring to nothing the beautiful culture I've given them, the space of human flourishing I've provided for them in the Holy Land. I'm going to take it away. But then it ends with, and as soon as it's reduced, there will be a holy seed. There will be the start of something new. This is crucifixion. This is not just a description of what happened to Israel when it had turned away from the Lord. It is a description of what would ultimately happen to Jesus, who, full of beauty, full of everything necessary for human flourishing, would be crucified, reduced like a stump to nothing, like a terebinth twice burned, or an oak twice burned. And yet in that crucifixion is the start of something new, a seed, God sharing himself again with those who lack him. God giving himself to the godless. That's the beauty of holiness. That's ultimately what beauty is. God sharing himself with the godless. It's not having a perfectly symmetrical face. It's not having 
necessarily beautiful surroundings. Okay. You can be in, in devastated surroundings. You can be someone who has been afflicted in such a way that you are personally deformed. Uh, you know, God forbid, but it can happen. And nevertheless, you're beautiful for Jesus sake. You're beautiful because God has remembered you, has come to you, has shared himself with you. God sharing himself with those who lack what he possesses. And wrapped up in that then is also the promise that there is a new creation coming, a new creation that will be filled with beauty, a new creation in which all things will be restored that are lost. All good things will be restored that are lost here. This brings us to the question of how this happens, and that brings us to another passage. And here we go to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 53 is a prophecy of Christ and the Messiah who is coming. We read this every Good Friday uh, publicly at church. And here is what the prophet says. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ there is specifically described as one who had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Christ became uh, the opposite of beauty for our sake. He became a twisted and deformed man. He became a rejected man. He became an, a forsaken man. He became a dead man, right? And yet, we're told, and this is where this strange beauty of God starts to be proclaimed. He was bearing our griefs. He was carrying our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. And by his stripes, we are healed. Christ, in absorbing all the ugliness of this world, is actually sharing a divine, uh, unearthly, and yet very earthy, new beauty for the earth, the beauty of the Lord's favor, the beauty of holiness, the beauty of God sharing with those who lack it all that he has and that we need from him, which then means it should come as no surprise when we read the following in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 gives, up, gives us another vision of God being worshipped on his throne, as we read in Isaiah chapter 6. But listen to how it changes a bit here in the New Testament. This is St. John writing, who had this vision while he was in exile. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing 
as though it had been slain. With seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So again, God on his throne, but a figure at the center of that worship, who is not simply a figure adorned with light and who causes the angels to quake at his beauty, but one who stands there as a lamb who has been slain, one who stands there with the marks of crucifixion still in his flesh. For we remember that after he rose from the dead, that's how he proved who he was. He showed the marks of crucifixion. This is Jesus who has been slain for us. Again, as with Isaiah, John has a sense of extreme unworthiness. But again, as in Isaiah, that sense of worthiness is remedied. Uh, that sense of unworthiness is remedied by the worthiness of Christ. He takes the scroll and opens it. Now, what's this about with the scroll? You may remember from prior studies on Revelation that the scroll, to put it simply for the sake of this study, is to, to open this scroll is to bring about the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Who is worthy to bring about that fulfillment of time and the fulfillment of God's promises in time? Christ is worthy. We aren't worthy, but Christ is worthy. He brings a worthiness to us that we lack. He who was slain for us. And so in the crucifixion of the Lord and in this crucified Lord himself who is risen from the dead, the beauty of God shines into the earth, a new kind of beauty, a beauty that transforms the human mind and heart and results in a new kind of art and culture among God's people. That is a new kind of place-making a new kind of um, placemaking that makes a space, a place where human beings flourish in a particular way. Great book. I've been talking about it off and on here this past year because we're using it as part of our confirmation curriculum with the kids who are to be confirmed in 7th and 8th grade. Uh, it's a book by, um, oh, I forget his name, Alvin Schmidt. How Christianity Changed the World. He talks about how this vision of beauty, which is the vision of God's, God's goodness being a shared goodness, a goodness he does not keep to himself, but that he actually gives to us at the point of the world's greatest ugliness, a beauty that is given in the midst even of our sin, a beauty that is shared even with the godless and the sinful. That, that vision changed how human cultures treated the sick, treated the weak, treated children, treated women, treated slavery and thought about slavery. This is why slavery began to pass away. How it thought about even things like uh, punishment, crime and punishment. How it thought about government and kings and family. How it thought about the land, how it thought about the world. All for the better. That's part of the beauty of the Christian faith. It is a beauty that comes from God. It is the beauty for which we've all been created. And this is why we desire beauty, because we've been created to have God. And so within us, there is and remains this desire for goodness, this desire for beauty. That desire leads us down all kinds of wrong paths because of our sin. But now the true beauty has come in Jesus Christ and is being shared with the world through his good word. So that's what we'll be talking about here for the next couple of weeks anyway, all prompted by this discussion I had with a, a colleague in ministry, as I told him about the Festival of Christian Arts and Culture, going to be held here at Zion, April 14th through 16th. 
He said to me, well, why are you doing that? No one really is going to care about beauty, are they? Beauty is not just decoration. <laughs> uh, beauty is the beauty of holiness, as the Psalms talk about it. And the beauty of holiness helps us see, first, that decoration isn't just decoration. And that all of human, human endeavor uh, finds its proper end in the creation of places where humans may flourish. And art is part of that. This is why we travel. This is why young kids wonder if they're beautiful. This is why older folks lament their perceived loss of beauty. Why do you care about beauty? And where are you going to find it? You ultimately care about beauty because you were created to know, desire, and receive God. And he is where you're going to find it. And we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. Let us pray. Most merciful Father, you are beautiful, and your beauty transcends our human imagination. Yet in great kindness you sent your Son to publish your beauty abroad in his holy word, a word born of his crucifixion and suffering for our sake. O Lord, receive our thanksgiving, our adoration, and our praise. And let this beauty dwell among us always within our hearts, our homes, and all of human culture to transform and change us, to lead us into a good life, a life that bears the cross, a life that enters into times of suffering and pain, that enters into places of sin, that embraces relationships, even among the godless, all for the sake of sharing your holy gospel and that goodness that transcends our hopes and at the same time satisfies them. We pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord's peace be with you.